Hello, hello, hello. Let's just check the volume levels before we get started. Mm, the microphone's looking a bit low, isn't it? Um, bear with me. Okay, is the microphone working any better? It's still very low, isn't it? Is that any better? That's a little bit better. I'm always paranoid about having the microphone not too far away, but and also having the simulator not completely drown me out. Okay, so I'll just grab my cup of tea. <laughs> this is going to be a bit of a an epic one, I guess, because it's the DC6, and it's always a bit of an epic one with the DC6. Um, because in the real world, the DC-6 had as many, a minimum of three crew and a maximum of six, I think. Should we include, you know, engineer, navigator, pilot, co-pilot? Um, oh, there's, there's so many different roles within the aircraft. Um, but we're going to be doing it single-handed, obviously. And we're not going to be using the automated flight engineer either, so we'll keep ourselves very very busy. So let's go and jump inside the aeroplane and close the door up. Take the pito covers off. You can actually see the things closing from outside. Everything's animated. It's really, really well done, actually. So I've been updating the checklist. I haven't actually got access to the latest one without disrupting the stream, so I'll just have to make do with what I've got here. And we'll we'll try and do this from the pilot position, I guess, rather than jumping around using keyboard shortcuts, because it gives you more idea of where things are around the aeroplane. So this isn't really intended to be a, a beginner's guide as such, but it will be... I'm just making sure that levers are working correctly. There's no spoilers, obviously, in the DC-6. OK, so we've got the ground power unit is on. We've already seen that in the tablet. So overhead, we're going to be doing, doing a lot of moving around and switching things around. So you've got a battery and ground power or off. So that's your master power switch, but you've also above it got where the power is coming from so we can go to ground power and it lights up the indicator meaning you know there is some power coming in and then we can turn on the master power switch and you can see a load of the, the dials come to life around the cockpit when you do that so immediately over the top of the pilot's head you can see the beacon light is here and the no smoking and the seatbelt lights are there and you've also got over here the, if I can see them all, I'm um, just digging around to, this is going to be a problem actually to get good views where you can see everything. I might have to turn the view around. Yeah, this is going to be a bit of a so-and-so actually. So I might have to, well, we'll have a look. So just above the... Um, the start switches for the engines, you've got the inverters. Yeah, it's going to be a problem to flick things the right way. But just be careful. We put the inverters on, and we put the engine instrument lights to normal, and then we go to the generator controls and turn them all to on. So some of these things we're doing a little bit out of order, but we're not a million miles away from uh, where we should be. So we open the cowl flaps up completely. I'll show you that outside in a moment to show you what, what's going on with those. So those are these, you can see them opening actually, they're animated. These vents, so that encourages the airflow to come in through the engine. Okay, we've done the cowl flaps. So we're going to go and set the uh, the cabin pressure, we're going to be at low altitude today, but having said that, actually, we probably want to go up to... 
um, about 9,000 feet. So we'll set the cabin pressure for 9,000. And then we're going to go and turn the radios on. So that's simple enough. You just turn the volume knobs on the various radios. You can switch on the GPS. Turn on the ADF. We're not going to be using ADF, but we'll switch it on anyway. Um, fuel selector levers, which are down here. So this is selecting where the fuel is coming from or any aircraft. So we push all these to the main tanks. We're only doing a short flight. It will be good. And then overhead, over here, we've got the cabin heater master switch goes on. At the back of the pedestal, we've got the mixtures. And we want to set them. Actually, for the moment, they need to be down at shutoff. And then as we fire the engines up, we'll lift them up to auto rich. So you can see that there. So we go through the engine start sequence now. So this is going to be fun to try and do with this view, actually. We might not get around the engines quickly enough with doing this. Um, yeah, this is <laughs> it's going to be fascinating, actually. Let's turn the volume up so you get to hear what's happening. So you've got a master engine select switch here. And we have to do the engines in a specific order in the real aircraft. They go three, four, two, one. So we're going to go to engine number three. And we're going to put the boost pump on for engine number three. And then we're going to flick the switch here. Three, <coughs> six, nine, twelve. And then... Can we get there quickly enough? Yes, we can. Just about. No, we didn't. So let's go and do that again. It didn't help that I coughed in the middle of it and you didn't hear it. I've had a wicked cold for the last few days. And it's not been going away. So let's go and bring everything back to as, it, as we started. I am going to use the keyboard shortcuts for this otherwise it's going to be a nightmare to try and show you it so control six will bring us overhead so we've got engine number three boost pump on and then three prime six boost nine twelve both And then fuel in. We should see outside. We have an engine that's starting to come up to speed and stabilizing slightly. Notice the whole engine is shaking. You will notice around the aircraft things are starting to shake. It will get a lot more shaky in a few moments. So control six, go back overhead. It's just quicker to do it this way. So number four next. So engine number four. Turn the boost pump off on number three. Put the boost pump on on number four. Three. Six. Nine. Twelve. Okay, so... Yeah, we can't quite get back overhead from that view. Look, it's a bit of a so-and-so, because you have to jump around the cockpit like Spider-Man to get things started. <laughs> so, engine number two goes next. So, main selector's number two. Engine number two. Three. Six. Boost. Five. Twelve. Oops. Oh, I missed the, I missed the mouse. Are we going to get away with it? And I've missed the... Keyboard shortcut as well. Oh, we got away with it, I think. So we'll wait for the energizers and prime and everything to stop, and then engine number one. The, when you, he's reading out those numbers, what we're actually waiting for is the flywheel to come up to speed. 
of turning the engine over and then so it's electrically started uh, and then we obviously kick in with the magnetos which fires it and then we ap apply fuel uh, engine number one so boost pump for number one Three. so he's, t he's counting propellers Six. going around Five. Um, I've seen PMDG's video, just looking at live stream comments. I'm actually following guidance that was, but this is the pilot operating handbook method really. And also I've had several long emails from XDC6 pilots about kind of castigating various authors of official documentation that's given out with the SIM. It's quite amusing really. Um, the DC-3 pilot was by far the most entertaining, saying basically the, the advice given that came with the aircraft would have um, damaged it irreparably. You know, you'd have had a, had a fire on your hands in very short order. Okay, so we can turn the engine selector off. We've got the magnetos all on both. This is all back to normal. Boost pumps are off. So we're okay to get on with the rest of the startup. I think it's always amusing how much things move around in this aeroplane. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> Everything judders. All the needles are moving. <laughs> Anyway, um, so we go overhead, so it, this becomes quite straightforward actually now. So we're switching over to using the plane battery instead of ground power now because the generators are running. And then we can go back in the tablet and remove the ground power unit away from the aeroplane. Um, and we can get ready to taxi, so it's just a question of removing the gust lock, which means we can now remove the flying surfaces. We can move the flaps to take off position, and we can go and put some lights on outside. So we, we don't have taxi lights in the DC-6, we only have landing lights. So you can, you can retract and extend them, and you can turn them on and off. quite bright and as you can see the flaps are like barn doors that actually looks wrong I think we might have a problem yeah with the control surfaces that looks a lot better okay so there is a run-up test we could do uh, where you take the engines up to 1500 rpm and obviously so if we do that just to show you so we're watching the RPM gauges here. It doesn't like it, does it? It's shaking around like a good one. And it's stabilised out now, look. So you've got um, BMEP, which is brake. Um, oh, crikey, manifold. Exhaust pressure, is it? I can never remember what the E stands for. Then you've got manifold pressure across the engine. So there's two lots of dials or needles there. Um, you've got the BMEP overall as well. You typically don't try and go any higher than 200. Um, flap position obviously, so yeah, that flap lever is being a so-and-so look. It's gone to 40 degrees. I was trying to get it to... I'm going to pull the controls and plug them back in again. I've had this a lot recently. There we go. So what we're looking for is 20 degrees. There we go. That's better. Uh, what, what was I saying? We've got the RPM as well. We've got the cylinder head temperatures over the other side. Everything works, by the way. 
So you've got the fuel flow, you've got oil pressures, oil temperatures, carburetor air. Well, something else that's worth pointing out, the carburetors do ice up on this in the right weather conditions. So you've got carburetor air controls there to warm up the carburetors if you need to. Um, there's pages and pages about all of this in the book. There's also a, a gyro pilot, so the radios aren't operational. These are the old radios, you know, from 50 or 70 years ago. Um, but the gyro pilot is operational, and there's a clutch down here. So you engage it, you switch it on, and then you pull the clutch to attach it to the flight control cables. So we'll see that while we're in flight. It's, it's very, very easy to use. Okay, so, yeah, we're not going to bother doing the run-up tests because this is a simulator and it's fine. But what we could do, just to show you it, there's an engine stress visualiser. You can see all we're showing at the moment is car carburetor temperature is a bit cold because we're on the ground. So it's, it's sucking in the air and it's in that region, you know, where it will form ice through the venturi and the carburetors. Okay, so let's have a look around the aeroplane. So we've got no wind, so we can just double back on ourselves. Let's go and check the sound. I'm just going to turn the engine down a bit. I'll turn the head tracking on. Brake mean effective pressure, that's it. I can never remember what BMEP stands for. But the um, the other thing you can do, actually I haven't covered that, this thing has superchargers. So I don't know if you've ever read about the way combustion engines work at altitude, but you run out of air pressure to effectively run the engine. So this can combat that by having superchargers which pressurise the air coming into the engine to therefore you know, give the combustion enough oxygen to still operate. But beyond that, at low altitude or in the, in the wrong weather conditions, you can also inject water into the engine to stop it from, to stop the engines from blowing themselves to pieces, basically. It's a fascinating aeroplane. It's got all sorts of tools to extract more and more performance. So if you were doing a heavy takeoff, for example, you needed loads of power, you can really push the manifold pressures, but you inject water to calm the engine back down again. So you can, you know, you can essentially overstress it on purpose, but actually make it more manageable to do that. I think that I forget the exact terms they use in the documentation. But they talk in terms of the aeroplane being basically explosive, <laughs> or the engines. It's a whacking great runway here. The nice thing about the DC-6 is you can land in quite a short distance. You can't really take off in a short distance though. So we keep an eye on that BMEP. Look at it racing up towards 200. So I'm just edging it back away from it. So we're watching the airspeed coming up through 80 knots and we can rotate. Look at it moving around. So we'll look from outside. Just told the gear to come up. Great big old shadow 
rumbling across the floor. <laughs> so we'll circle the airfield that we've just left from before we go anywhere. Just lowering the nose gently, keeping an eye on the, the climb right here, watching the airspeed gather. Again, ready to raise the flaps. So we can also go and pull these back in now. We should have had these on four degrees actually. Uh, we're going to go more for a cruise setting now, which would be two degrees just for the moment. On the cow flaps, uh, if I could control them. Flaps up. So once it's uh, you know running fairly smoothly, you can see. Look, I haven't changed the throttles, but the needles have fallen away on the BMEP. Manifold pressure is probably a bit high. We don't want more than about 45. But obviously you can look at this and it, this will stabilise out as the temperatures come up. Yeah, so we're running it a bit hot at the moment. So what you would normally do is And notice the pressure required to turn those props. So we actually pull the throttles back now. But look at it accelerating. 160 knots. So just looking at Bragg's comment there, does it fly as well as the other PMDG aircraft? It's probably the best of the lot. In terms of it being smooth and predictable so we didn't calibrate the um, altimeter, oh we haven't got the transponder on either this is me not following the checklist properly isn't it and we also didn't turn on the DME but we're not actually using the radios, we could do in a moment actually let's have a look at the map so we're going to spin around to about going directly north, 11560 on the nav radios. So let's go and have a look up here. So let's come alive on nav 1. And we want to go north, so we're just we're flying 90 degrees at the moment. So we're going off to the right of that north track, but we'll just continue our turn. We don't really need to worry about this. The engines will stabilise out as long as we keep them within limits. It's just good to have it there as a reference. So you can see the direction to that beacon is coming round towards us. Okay, so then I'll show you how the autopilot works. So you turn the gyro pilot on, then you engage the clutch, and you'll see I've let go of the joystick. So it's essentially, it's climbing at whatever rate we were climbing at. So we can control pitch with these wheels. So if I rotate them, you'll see the, the pitch react. If you want to fly level, 
you just hit alt uh, altitude control and you will see the aeroplane level itself out. If you want to turn, you just rotate this knob and it will you'll see the pit the um, the bank angle will go over and obviously the more you turn the knob the steeper the turn you get. If you want to stop it from turning, you just press the silver button and it will level out whatever direction it's going and carry on going that direction. So we want to go right probably 30 degrees. So if we tell it to go right for a bit. You can see the direction we're going here, look, compared to the beacon. about to pass the beacon by the look of it. I'm just watching what this needle is doing. Oh no, it's a little way ahead of us. Okay, we're fine. Okay, let's stop that turn. Um, yeah, so just reading the comments there, the gust lock, if you attach it, then you can't control the aeroplane. You won't be, you'll only have a very small amount of movement on the yoke, so you won't be able to do much with it. So you can see we've got the main tank's fuels here, so we've got lots and lots of fuel. You can almost cross the Atlantic in this thing. Obviously it'll take like 15 hours to do it. But if you trim the engines out perfectly and lean them out, you can do it. And obviously you need um, good weather conditions for it to happen as well. It's not down there. Has that actually been modelled properly? Oh, we need to go and um, set the cow flaps for cruise. So yeah, if you have a look around at the, the various instruments, so we're running the engines quite slow at the moment so we can push on a little bit. This aeroplane is quite odd in that it doesn't really like going slowly. It's tuned for cruising for hours and hours at kind of 220 knots or thereabouts. Yeah, you can see at the moment, look, we're quite happily chugging along about 220. It's quite quick. We've got a slight discrepancy in fuel flow between 3 and 4 there, look. Even though the RPMs are matching, so there's something you often see in the DC-6 is some variability. So that may indicate something wrong that may you know may get worse over time the rest are looking good so we're not in the danger areas anywhere and we're coming up to about 230 knots But this aeroplane came out before most of the others in the sim. It was the first one that PMDG released a long time before they did the 737s. And it's arguably still the best historic aircraft, I think. You know, by quite some distance. Because, I mean, you look at the quality of the rendering of everything, it's, it's like looking at a photograph. It's very, very good. even down to the nuts and bolts on the window, look.
all the seats. <laughs> of course, the rest of the I've not even thought to show you any of this. Spares for various pieces of the aeroplane that might go wrong. Okay, so we're going to go to manual control, so we're going to go and disengage the clutch and then turn the gyro pilot off fly the aeroplane for a bit. So let's go and have a look at the map first. So we want to go left, we're going to go over towards um, Yosemite Valley. bit high on the BMEP so I'm going to pull the engine back slightly. There's two ways of doing that, you can either increase the propeller RPM yeah, which reduces the power required to turn the propellers because you're effectively reducing the pitch by increasing the RPM by reducing the pitch you're lowering the torque required to achieve the RPM if that makes any sense at all. Okay, so we've got to go over the top of these hills. That's fine. One thing this aircraft is good at because of the superchargers is you can do high altitude. So you can get to 20,000 feet without too much trouble. Yeah, it's um it's an interesting one. I put a blog post out earlier just about, you know, the various subjects that this aeroplane causes you to have to learn. And things like the um yeah, the relationship of using the superchargers to compress the air coming into the engines at high altitude. So at low altitude obviously I can show you it without damaging it as long as I don't do it for too long. If I open the engines right up Yeah, we can go beyond the BMEP and the manifold pressure limits of the engines, which is where you can essentially combust the engines. So you can obviously you can inject water to counter that to an extent, but as you climb in altitude, that situation reverses itself, and you end up that at maximum power, you're not getting enough manifold pressure to run the engines and to generate enough heat. So, you know, for the combustion to work. So you end up putting the superchargers on, which spin up and compress the air coming into the engine to put enough air onto the, into the cylinders, you know, to fire properly. And then as you come back down, you turn the superchargers back off, off obviously. There's some fantastic ideas in planes of this era. You know, it kind of explains the history of how we figured out how to do each thing. Right, let's have a look at the map. So, we'll have a bit of an explore around the Yosemite Valley when we get there. Should start seeing some place, places we recognise soon. It has radial engines, yes it does. Great big radial engines. I think they are, and I forget the proper terminology, but there's two banks of pistons inside them. 
one behind the other. They're enormous engines. I think they're like something crazy, like three or four thousand horsepower. Any passenger views? I've not actually tried. I'd have to put the autopilot on. I guess we could quickly, couldn't we? So if I put the gyro pilot back on, engage the clutch, and go for altitude hold, that will keep us going in a straight line. What I'll do... Yes, there is. I'm just using the... It's not super detailed. But there is a cabin. And you can see I haven't turned the drone camera speed down. Okay. So... Turn the gyro pilot back off. Turn the clutch off. And okay, so we're looking that way to find the famous part of the valley El Capitan. And is that one of the dome? One's over there, I think it might be actually. Half Dome, is it called? We'll know when we get there. It's much more recognisable when you're on top of it. You don't realise how big the DC-6 is until you see it parked next to something else. I went taxiing past the Cessna the other day on a group flight and my wing went right over the top of the Cessna without touching it. <laughs> yeah, we're heading for the right part of the valley. We're, we'll have to do a bit of navigating around in circles. We'll maybe fly the length of the valley. We went in at the far end. Is it putting like fake snow in? Well, maybe it is snowing there at the moment. So it might be a bit obscured by snow. I guess we could always change the weather to... Um, should we try it? Let's put it on... a few clouds instead. Yeah, otherwise you'll lose out on seeing the nice views of Yosemite. So here's one of the famous rocks. Half Dome is called. So we're going to double back in a moment and go back down the valley. We'll go around, right round over the top of here and drop in and come back through. Stephen is asking whether I fly in the real world. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm no different than any other aviation enthusiast. Um, 
I have a family and a job and a busy home life, so this tends to happen late at night messing around with the simulator, but yeah, I'm just interested in aviation. It's almost an accident that I've ended up with a YouTube channel, to be honest. Just before the start of the pandemic, I was given a computer, because I didn't have a computer capable of running a flight sim at all. Even though I work as a software developer, at home I didn't really have much. And then uh, my dad gave me a computer that was capable of running flight sim, because he was upgrading. And then I started flying online with a group that he was a member of called My Air and the Southwest Flight Sim Club, or group, sorry. And um, after that, I started sharing a few videos along the way, just for a bit of fun, with them. And then one day, I realised that lots of people had started watching the videos, and that was kind of the beginning of the channel. I have flown a real aeroplane though, having said that. Um, next door neighbour years and years ago when I was young was um, training to be a pilot and he needed to get his hours up so I went up with him and he let me control the aeroplane for quite some time and it was interesting actually. It did validate that it's very much the same as a simulator. You know, the real, the skills you acquire to operate a simulator are, are the same. I guess it depends on the person as well. I'm apparently very good at switching off my senses and trusting instruments. It was something he remarked on. They'd not seen it before that somebody could come along and fly, up, you know, fly by instruments essentially without looking outside, which I got told off for. He asked me to fly an altitude, a heading, and a speed, and I did, robotically. That looks amazing, doesn't it? Yeah, everything I've learned that I share on the channel, I'm usually just a page ahead of anybody watching, if that. Quite often, I get people commenting or emailing me privately that are um, ex-pilots, and they come back with loads of really, really good feedback. Yeah, about, and often with really entertaining stories that maybe they don't want to share in public, but yeah, I get some great emails from people. Often of these historic aircraft. This is the rock face that's famous for people climbing it, isn't it? Let's try not to slam into the hillside, eh? I'm worrying because I've been running the engines quite slowly to avoid rolling downhill like a, an out of control school bus um, but the engines are, won't be happy with me doing that it will lower the, the temperatures the, the um, DC-6 isn't really designed for this at all it's designed to cruise at speed I'm just 
watching that BMEP, it's getting a bit high. Watching at some of the other gauges. Looking okay, actually. So let's have a look at the map. So we're just coming down through the end of the valley and then we'll scoot across, follow the river down I guess, over to Pine Mountain and figure out how we're going to approach. Okay, so if we start turning right, what direction do we want to be going? About two, well, about three hundred, maybe. So just keep an eye on the gyro compass. I think they drift, so you have to be careful. So you look at the binnacle compass as your main source of truth. Yeah, it looks like the they haven't drifted, so we're good. I'm just watching the, the, the um, direction here versus the magnetic compass or whiskey compass. Good overhead. How do you fly the DC-3 Classic? I'll have to do a video with that. I haven't been in that for ages. It's been a long, long time. So one of the things that becomes problematic with the DC-6 is slowing it down. Because of its propensity to charge along, you know, it's designed to do this sort of speed. Um, slowing down is a problem, because it's quite sleek, and it's quite heavy, and you're not supposed to run the engines without them pulling. You know, they're not designed to idle. Oh, we've got the ATIS is coming through on the radio. Let's go and get rid of that. Okay, let's descend down and start slowing down. So I'm going back to 50% throttle, but I'm not going to go to idle. One of the tactics you can use in things like the DC-6 is to side-slip them on purpose to slow down. But if you plan well enough from far enough out, you don't need to. See what I meant about that? So I increased the propeller speed 
and the pressure fell off. Because to increase the propeller speed, you reduce the pitch, which requires then less torque, less power to spin the propellers at that speed. It's an interesting one, isn't it? that then gets you into trouble. If you run the engines too slowly, you start to get problems with keeping things in the right temperature range. Look, you can see the oil temperature's dropped. And you can see, yeah, the, the carburetor air is getting cold. And because of that, we could get carburetor icing. So you start to have to play silly games with, um, I'm gonna increase the power for the moment. to get the carburetor temperatures up. But um, what you can do, you're not supposed to do it short term though, carburetor. I'm just gonna, how stable are we? Oh, it's being a so-and-so, isn't it? And look how quickly that's had an effect. It's lifted us out of icing range very, very quickly. So again, if you've never read about that, the cause of icing in carburetors, it's the Venturi effect. Same thing as if you have a compressed air bottle and you squirt it on your hand, it feels cold. It's exactly the same physics quirk. Okay, so we have circled and missed the airfield is behind us. So let's turn. I've not seen this airfield before, so I have no idea what we are facing, or what the approach might look like. So this tight turn is scrubbing some speed off, which is good. There's the beacon. So we'll fly an orbit of the airfield to, to kind of figure out our plan. Right, so for approach, we need to open the cowl flaps back out. There's the runway. We are just about slow enough to put the wheels out. I'm just going to slow down a bit more. So remember I said what we can do to slow down is slip the aeroplane. You just need to be careful. There we go, that's enough. It's a bit of an air show style manoeuvre, but I put the wheels down and they're obviously going to cause an enormous amount of drag. So we're getting within flaps range as well. So we'll extend downwind a little way. Turn right first and give us a wider turning arc to come in. A bit more power. We're going to increase the propellers as well. Oh, 
also keeping an eye on the turn coordinator because this aeroplane will skid enormously. You have to kind of keep it in a tight turn. You need to keep it oriented correctly. I've lost sight of the airfield. We've come around far too tightly now. Okay. So notice what I said about the turn coordinator. This aeroplane was flying sideways then for a moment. So we're forcing it to go the right direction. can help it turn by using one side or the other on the engines. <laughs> We're just fitting on the taxiway. <laughs> the skin of my teeth. To tell, get told off by the groundsman. You get some idea of how big we are when you get near buildings, look. We tower over everything.
Okay, so... Um, easiest way to shut the engines down. I get one way of doing it is to starve them, so you can shut the mixture off, and then it uses up any leftover fuel. Which stops them pretty quickly. <laughs> I'm just trying to think what I switched on around the cockpit. I'm going to turn things back off now. So we could go and ask for ground power, which will stop us getting into any sorts of trouble. So if we go in here and say... Can we have the ground power unit, please? So if we look outside. I see that's been plugged in. Oh, it's a, a battery on a cable, basically. <laughs> so having done that, though, we can come in here and switch over to using it here. So then the light comes on, and then you can turn the batteries off in the aeroplane. Turn the inverters off, turn the engine instrument lights off, turn the seat belts and the smoking signs back off, turn the beacon light back off. I do things completely out of order by the way, but it just shows you that you know it's it all works. Turn the heating back off. Uh we already did the landing lights, didn't we? Yeah, so we're looking good. Obviously you can then just go and pull the external power if you need to. Uh, oh sorry, turn that off so that can go back to off over here now. But there's a ton of stuff on the tablet as well actually. Uh, let's see if I can... So the front cabin exit, if we go and look at that, let's see it opening. And then we can go and look at the stairs. and open the cargo holds and the, the main cabin exit and the main cabin stairs. What else can we do? Tow bar under tractor, wheel chocks, pito covers, oil pans, and mechanic stands. It's very cool, isn't it? I think Red Bull own two of the surviving DC-6s in the world. And they use them for, you know, ferrying some of their stunt stuff around the world. Because this is the six DC-6B, this is the passenger version. There's a DC-6A, which is a cargo variant, which has got no um, windows. It's got a much bigger access door in the side. But yeah, it's good, isn't it? So we didn't really cover this while we were flying around. So oh, this is the ramp manager. So obviously you can get some shortcuts here to go to different aircraft states, so you don't have to do everything we did. Um, there's the fuel manager and cargo payload manager. There's the auto, oh, sorry, artificial flight engineer. I always think of it as the automated flight engineer, but anyway. Um, he's kind of a, an artificially intelligent presence in the cockpit. So if you ask him to get the aeroplane ready for start, he will go and busy himself and you can hear him reading out the checklist as he does it. 
and you could do that for all phases of flight. And you know, he'll just get get the airplane ready for takeoff, get it ready for cruise, get it ready for you know whatever the different phases are. Uh, there's maintenance, so you can get to see how damaged the airplane is. <laughs> there's the engine stress visualizer. Obviously, at the moment, the engine's not operating. It's saying the carburetor temperatures are absolutely fine now, though. <laughs> it's saying the cylinder heads are cold, which is what you'd expect. And there's some options as well, so you can have the 430 or not. Or actually, no, we can have cheap PMDG Bendix radios, which gives you just a normal set of NAVCOM and ADF radios, which I think are a little bit better, actually. They're more befitting of the era than having a GPS up there. Realistic engine damage you can have on, realistic starting. So I had that dumbed down to an extent, which is why we were able to so easily start it. I was, to be honest though, the routine I was doing would have worked with the realistic start, depending on the air temperature. The procedure for starting the engines does change according to if it's cold or wet or... Yeah, it's good, isn't it? It's a hell of a thing. Obviously, because we've opened that door now, if we look out here now, we can see the stairs. Oh, sorry, I've got this slightly zoomed in, which is making it look a bit kind of panoramic. But yeah, it's very cool. Anyway, I'm going to call it there because it's getting late. I just thought it'd be good fun to have another look at the DC-6 and to fly through some pretty scenery with it. <laughs> Obviously it can fly for thousands of miles. We only took it for a couple of hundred miles. So yeah. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for watching and I'll see you again soon.